Good morning, everyone. And yeah, my name is Sergey. This is Adam and Eid with me today. And we will speak about life cycle problem. So probably many of you attended yesterday at a Git's talk where he introduced new architecture components. He introduced live data, view model, new persistence library named Room. And today we will focus on life cycle part of this architecture components. So we will speak again about live data and view model. We will speak about life cycle owners and life cycle events that are basics for these <coughs> libraries. But we will have more details. We will have some reasoning behind our decisions. So if you attended yesterday, it will be still interesting. If you didn't attend yesterday, we will reintroduce all of these things so you will understand everything. And uh, so let's see what we have today. And uh, today we have a, an activity in the fragments on start methods that not for line length, but dozens and dozens line of li <coughs> lines. And these lines are results of very natural process. Like Google Play services ask you to register them in on start methods. Your own components need to know about these lifecycle events, so you need to forward them in some kind of API. And correspondingly, on the unstop method, you have to call all pairing stop methods. And it's very easy to forget one. And this will result in a subtle bug. It will drain a user's battery. And they will enjoy your app a bit less, which is probably healthier for them. But we think that's bad. And uh, we think the answer on this <coughs> Situation is introduce lifecycle aware components. So, components which handle lifecycle. And the first step in this direction is to introduce lifecycle as a first class citizen. So, it's a very simple object which answers you on the question what is the current state right now? And notify you about new events. And the note which is important but sounds ridiculous right now events and states are different things. So, let's see what I mean. Your activity is a instantiated in initialized state. And uh, all cr uh, creation phases pass very routinely. On create, created state. On start, started state. Same thing for resume. But the row down is a bit in more interesting. So on pause event leads you from resume state back to the started state, not even new pause state or something like that. And the reason for this is, from a system perspective, the, sta uh, the states after on pause event and on start event are the same because the sets of the actions that you are allowed to do is the same. And the same is true for on stop and the created state. And the last event is on destroy. It's pretty straightforward. <coughs> it brings you to destroyed state. Your activity is destroyed, it's going to be thrown away and garbage collected. Well, so let's make our component lifecycle aware. That's super straightforward. We tag it with lifecycle observer interface. It's empty interface. To get actual events, we add annotation and pass the events that we are interested in. You can pass multiple events if you want to. La last step is to add ourselves as an observer. And we may have a potential problem here. What if an activity is already started at this point? Does this mean that we are going to receive on stop event and we are not even we didn't receive on start? And our component probably is not ready for this. But we took care of it and we bring the observer to the correct state. So what does this mean? Let's take this example which I just discussed. From activity perspective, on start and uh, on create already happened. And after that, we add an observer. But observer will still receive on create and on start events, like immediately when they were registered. So let's take like one step further. On resume, same situation, resume state. We bring to resume state. We, add, we got an on resume event in addition to on create and on start. A bit more interesting situation. On pause. In this situation, we are in a started st state as well, as we learned. So we bring the observer to the car correct state, which is started. So it's a similar situation as we had one minute ago. 
Observer will receive on create and on start events. And that's it. So we don't have a problem in this code. So how to get this magical lifecycle object? We have uh, this interface, which is super simple, but this probably doesn't help much right now. And the actual question is, who are lifecycle owners out of box? And answer in this question is support library uh, fragments and support activity. But unfortunately, this is true only in bright future. And right now, we have lifecycle activity and lifecycle fragment. But at the point of 1.0 release, we will merge our library to support library so you don't have to use them later. And now Adam will speak about some key difference between fragment and lifecycle observers. So if you've been following along, you probably recognize some similarities with the fragment API in this as well. So at this point, we've got these two different components. Which one do you use? Well, as the slides are already spoiling for you, this really isn't an, easy or an either or question. One of these things doesn't necessarily replace the other, and here's why. Fragments on one hand that everybody knows and loves, right, um, are statefully managed and recreated after uh, either a process death, an activity recreation, or a recreation of any host that you have the fragment within. Fragments manage views and also interact with the navigation stack, which are things that are firmly out of scope of what lifecycle observers are meant to do. Instead, lifecycle observers are meant to enable more granular factoring of your code, whether you're in an activity or a fragment. They're stateless, so that means that they must be registered each time the owner is recreated. We're not going to try to recreate these magically for you. They don't have any concept of instance state that they carry around with them. So these are meant to be very, very lightweight so that you don't have a whole lot of additional management overhead. And last, there's no relation to the viewer navigation management. These really are meant to be very tightly scoped, isolated components. So they can really help everyone. It means that it's much simpler to integrate libraries with your code, as long as those libraries have provided lifecycle observer aware components. It means that you can break up those really large fragment or activity classes to make them much simpler to understand for a reader. And you can provide much more granular guarantees around what operations are valid at any given point in time. You can make it so that if an operation happens, then you're guaranteed to be in a correct state when something is called. So lifecycle owner, as already introduced, is just an interface. Anyone can implement this. This means that you can improve testability by creating your own. You can create your own sort of fragment-like library implementations if you feel so inclined. But you can also create composite lifecycles, lifecycles that span across other smaller lifecycle definitions. So you can answer questions like, is my app visible? So this is a really common composite lifecycle that many of you may be interested in. It lets you do things like session management to track a particular session across perhaps some sort of a flow or a series of uh, log logged in versus logged out events. And it may help you with analytics as well. So we have the process lifecycle owner as kind of a component that I think a lot of you will be uh, interested in for this. It's the composite lifecycle of all the activities in your app. So there's no configuration changes to handle because we're not going to be dealing with those from these. these uh, the process lifecycle owner just stays alive through the whole process. But that also means that you don't get state res restoration after process death, like we mentioned earlier. So that means that uh, you don't have to handle saving and restoring that state, but at the same time, you need to remember to re-register these process lifecycle-based uh, observers if that's something that you're working with. So many Android components uh, provide a lot of kind of deep plumbing layers for things that uh, you can plug into and work with. But a lot of times, we've kind of omitted the idea of higher level components that make use of that plumbing so that you can just plug, play, and go. So I mean, do we have anything more high level than the bare events and states here? Maybe we do. Let me show you. Great. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. <Whoop>. So, <clears throat> so it's so nice. Now you can observe a life cycle. It's well-defined. It's a first class citizen. But you still need to deal with these things. And we thought, like, OK, there is some common life cycle problems that we should be able to solve with these components. So we look at the problems that people are having. And this was the, probably the most major problem we have been seeing, the untimely UI updates. It's like 
when your activity receives a callback, but the activity is already stopped, it tries to start a new activity and crashes, or it tries to add a fragment and crashes. If an activity or a fragment is stopped, you really, there is no reason to update that activity, right? You don't want to do that. If the activity happens to become visible again, then you want to do it. So we realized that this is a very common problem, and we wanted to solve this with a higher level component, which we call live data. Now we'll look at the live data in detail. It's actually an observable data holder. It just holds on to some information that you can observe. Now, the difference between live data and your other observables in data binding or RxJava or whatever is that live data is lifecycle aware. It knows about Android life cycles, and when you want to observe a live data, you can pass in this life cycle so that it can manage your subscription. Nice thing about live data is that you observe, and that's all you do. So we'll look at a usage example. Let's say we have an activity. We receive a live data from somewhere. It doesn't really matter. And then we call observe on it. And when we are calling observe, we are passing this, which is the lifecycle owner. That's all you need to say. I want to observe this live data within this lifecycle, which also means if this lifecycle is gone, I don't want to observe it. Or if this lifecycle is stopped, I don't want to receive events. And then once you do this, that's all you do. You don't need to write on start, on stop. We want Android development to more look like this. You initialize things. It's more like fire and forget. You initialize, and you are done. So let's look at what happens when our activity starts observing that live data. So on create, it called observe. We said live data is observable. And as soon as activity starts, it starts receiving data changes. So whenever the live data's value changes, we dispatch that event back to your observer inside the activity. It can also be a fragment. Uh, let's say user decides to rotate the activity at this moment, so you know that the activity will be stopped. And what happens at the same time the live data happens to be updated? If that happens, we are not going to tell the activity about this change, because there cannot be any reason for you to update the UI, because it's already stopped. Similarly, if the activity is destroyed, we will automatically remove that subscription because that activity is gone. We know about it. There is no reason to keep a reference back to that activity. Now, we said the activity was rotated, so you know that Android is going to recreate that activity. And then we are observing the same live data back. As soon as the activity starts, it's going to receive last available data. So your UI is going to have the data before it gets a chance to draw. So similarly, I say user hit the home button, which means the activity will be stopped. Again, if the live data changes while the activity is stopped, it's not going to receive any events. Even if the data changes, we are not going to tell it. But as soon as if the user comes back to the application, we will give it the last available data. So this is why we call live data is not just a stream of events. It holds on to the data so that if a new observer comes, it receives the last available value. And then eventually, the user backs out of that activity, and then we remove that subscription. You can also extend the live data class. When you extend, because live data provides two very handy callbacks. <clears throat> the first one is called on active, which means you have an active observer. Another one is called on inactive, which means you don't have any observers, so don't bother changing your value if it is something that you care about. You probably ask now, what is an active observer? Active observer is an observer whose attached lifecycle is started or resumed. So it's like a fragment that's currently visible to the user. If the fragment is on the back stack, the user is not seeing it, it's stopped, so it's not active. There is no reason to do any work for that fragment. Let's see how we can take advantage of these new callbacks. So, so we are going to create a new location live data class, which represents the location of something on the device. So we say this, is an, this data holds an instance of a location. In constructor, we just get the location manager from the system service. There's nothing fancy here. And we have a listener. Whenever the system server sends us a new location, we just call set value on us. That's all you do. There is no lifecycle handling here. You just call set value, 
and live data takes care of handling the life cycle. And you may have any number of observers. It doesn't really matter. So we want to overwrite on active, right? The very, the very first active observer comes. We want to start listening to the system service. Similarly, when the last active observer goes away, we want to stop observing the system service. Now, if you look at that location live data class we just created in the previous example, let's look at the properties of that class. First of all, it is lifecycle aware. It knows when to start itself, when to stop itself. You just don't need to babysit it anymore. It is self-sufficient. Like, you start it, you forget about it. It can even be a singleton. Like, all of these subscriptions are automatically managed for you. So if the data is logically singleton in your code base, you can make the live data instance singleton. Uh, so there is this thing where, like, normally, if you keep a reference to an activity or a fragment from a static context, that will be a big no, no. But if you are using live data, it is yes, yes, because we manage the subscription for you. So you also don't need to subclass a live data all the time. So if you just need an instance of it, but you already have the value, you can use this mutable live data class, which comes inside the library that has a public setter. But usually, when you are using this class, internally you will have it, but the API you expose will just return a live data because you don't want to expose the fact that anyone can set the value on it. Now, when we were designing these lifecycle components, the live data, actually we spent a lot of time to get rid of one exception. This fragment exception that I. <laughs> We really wanted to say, please, no more fragment transaction exceptions. So live data guarantees that if you received an event, you can run a fragment transaction. And to, to see how we are making it part of the history, I want to invite Adam back to explain it to us. All right, so anyone, <clears throat> anyone who's received one of these exceptions realizes that it doesn't just come from trying to do something when you, you're just completely stopped and you absolutely know it. These exceptions tend to come in when you get into very intricate uh, nested life cycles. So we wanted to make sure to be very thoughtful about defining how the lifecycle observer callbacks are invoked and when. So in a case like this, what happens? You have defined, uh, defined handler for the stop event. So in the container, your activity on stop, you want to make sure that you don't get an on changed event after the on stop has happened. But in, but in order for that to happen, what needs to be true about when we actually invoke all of the on-stop listeners and that are attached to these observers? So we have to define a really strict order for this. So as we go through create and start and on resume, we know that we need to invoke the lifecycle observers after the container event happens. So you know in your observer that everything about your lifecycle owner has been configured. If you check any state about it, you know that you're already completely in that state. But that means something really special for coming back down the other direction. It means that when, we, when the activity starts to become paused, you want your lifecycle observers to be able to shut down anything that they're doing before the activity does all of the work to actually become paused. Similar for stop. And this is where th this becomes really important for the fragment transaction exception. You want to make sure that, you s that you're recording that you're fully stopped before the fragment system goes through and flags everything as being completely locked out. So what that means is that the stop event of your lifecycle observer will always be invoked before the activity on stop or before the, um, before the full stop event for your container happens. So this seems really similar to some other libraries that uh, some people may have seen in the past. Uh, can you talk about that? Yep. Uh, yes. So when we create new observable pattern, like nowadays, this question is unavoidable. Is it in another Rix Java? And the uh, answer to this question is yes, because we want to promote the reactive programming model, especially when it comes to relationship between your UI and the state of this UI. We want to, you to react on the changes of the state. So it means that it's a reactive programming model. But on the other hand, no, because it is lifecycle aware out of box. 
as Git mentioned. And it's much easier. As many of you may know, learning curve, curve of Rx Java is super steep. And if you have an Android learning curve, and after that we add Rx Java learning curve on top of this, it becomes very hard to new people to start to develop on our platform. So we just can't just say to them, like, oh, let's go. Just learn this. That's it. No. So, but if you already learned Eric Java, we don't, you to, don't expect you to migrate from it to our solution. Because you already pass this learning curve. You, you and your coworkers are comfortable with it. Fine. We are totally fine with this. But one thing we ask you to do is to be sure that you manage life cycle. Eric Java has common approaches to solve this. Be sure they use it, and everything will be fine. But when you start, when you start a new app, we think that this model is the best. The best is to start a project with a live data, because it's simpler, it's faster, it's lightweight, it's well integrated with a framework. And if you feel like you love reacting programming a lot, you want to bring it not only to relation between UI and uh, state, you want to bring it to your business parts of your application, then you may consider addition of Rx Java, because, because it gives you like, more power. And we will actually help you to do that. We have this extension to our library, which give, gives you a possibility to create live data from publisher and uh, create publisher from live data. So this integration should be quite smooth. But I want to highlight a key difference between Rx Java and live data. So as Eid already said, live data is a holder, not a stream. So we have a reference to the last value, and observers immediately receive the last value when they start to, start to observe live data. Another big difference is the threading model. As you know, Rx Java has a very sophisticated threading model. It's extremely powerful, but in most cases, you probably don't need it. And, and we have everything on the main thread. And the reason for this is we want to give you all these guarantees about when we will notify you about state changes. So, and we can't do this on a background thread. We have just one exception. We have a post value method, which just utility method, which trampoline value from a background thread to the main thread and set it there. It's super simple. So quick summary of what we have at this point. Life cycle events, observable pattern which respects these events. But there is one big thing which is not covered yet. And this is uh, how to handle configuration changes. Yep, in 2017, like almost nine years after Android was first time released, we still discuss this question. And this is a total legit question. And we hear it constantly from uh, new Android developers. Many of you probably know what's the deal with it, but let's take a look on this oversimplified example, but still very vivid. So you want to show this information about user and your activity. And you want to make a, some web service request. We will use live data to get this result. It's super simple. When the request just started, it's empty. When the request, uh, a request response is received, we put this it, it to live data as a value. And live data will update our UI. It will notify activity, and it will done everything it needs. So what happens if activity is going to be rotated? Yep, we're going to make it call twice. And I hope that you don't call web service right into your activity, but you prob probably have some abstractions and you need that does something like that, which goes to a network, which go to, I don't know, caching and persistent storages. And this, all these operations are asynchronous by, the na by nature. So uh, communication with these components are asynchronous. And you probably don't want to make these calls twice 
anyway. So what you want to do is to cache this user data, like in our example. And what are the ways today to do that? Well, one of the proposed ways to do it is a fragment.setRetain instance. And it can rant about this for hours. Unfortunately, we don't have a time for this today. But I just say, like, the only fact that you have to run fragment transaction is terrifying for a lot of people. People go nuts. And another, key, another possible way to solve this is uh, loaders, but they don't fit here well as well. So we decided to tackle this problem once again and create view model. So what is this? View model is an object which is associated with a fragment or an activity, but is retained during configuration changes. So its, its scope is a kind of a logical scope of your activity. So what does this mean? Let's see. We have an access time and a current moment, and we can predict the future. And we know that activity is going to be created, and this means that all constructions events are going to happen. During on create, we will request the model for the first time. We will create it, and after that, this activity just uses this view model. Pretty simple. Now we predict that activity is going to be rotated. Let's see what's going to happen with our view model. We will receive. We will receive uh, events, this pause, some stop, and destroy. But when all these events are cured and your activity is destroyed, is thrown away, and it's garbage collected, the model survived it. And the new activity, which was created in place of the old one, uses the same old object. So you can easily cache their live data as we want to or something else. In the last case, what is going to happen if we have a finish call? Once again, we will receive these destruction events. But this time, the model is available until on destroy method. During on destroy method, we will call on clear on this, on it, uh, which notifies you if you have any currently running actions or any resources, it's time to close. And after that, it's going to be destroyed and garbage collected as well. So at the point when your activity is destroyed, it's not going to be recreated again. Your view model is gone as well. So let's quickly make our sample in view model. So we start with instantiating with creation of a view model class. We want to cache the user data. We create a field for that. We create our activity needs to access this live data, so we create a getter for this. And finally, getter is extremely straightforward. If we already requested the data, we just return it. If, we, if the data is now, OK, we request it from a web service and returns it. Fine. We had this code in our activity. Now we need to get this live data from view model. To get it, we need to create to get view model somehow. So this is how we do. Let's take a precise look on it. First of all, we need to, to get view model provider object. This is an object which is associated with a fragment or an activity. It knows how to get already existing view model from it, or how to create a new one if uh, there is no existing view model. After that, we request our, our my activity view model. And later, is everything is quite simple. We get a user data, we observe it to uh, update the UI. Fine. So what are the rules uh, of usage of view model? So view model manage the data for the UI. It means that it speaks with uh, business parts of your application to retrieve the data. So it may be repository pattern or any other pattern that you use. It also it forwards user modifications back to these components. Another good case for vmodel is acting as a communication layer between fragments in one activity. And it will speak about this a bit later. But prior to this, things that you must not do in your vmodels. So first of all, you must not access views and any other UI-related entities. The reason for that, 
they are going to be recreated during configuration change. If you try to use them, you will ever use stale data from there, ever leak them. It's like, that's going to be finished bad. And if it's fragmented or activity's job to bind the data that you will get from a view model with actual UI, text views, buttons, I don't know what else. And uh, one more thing, there are resources which sounds more harmless, like strings or drawable. And you may think, I may cache it here. No. They depend on current configuration st state as well. So yes, at, right now, you may have just one resource for every configuration. But later, you will add the, the same resource for different configuration. You will easily forget to update your view model. So, and you may not, may not notice this. Your user, but your users will see the invalid UI. And this is just ugly. And now it will speak about interfragment communications. So I want to talk about one of, the, one of my favorite features about ViewModel, which is communicating between multiple fragments of the same activity. Uh, so it's a good UI like this, like the Gmail on a tablet, where on the left side, you pick an email, and on the right side, it shows the contents of that email. Now, usually, you will implement this as a fragment on the left, which picks something from the list, and another fragment on the right, which shows how to show the contents of an email, so that if you're on the phone, you can reuse the same fragments, but separate from each other. Now, if you ever try to write a UI like this, if you ever try to make these two fragments talk to each other, it's a pain in the neck. It's very, very hard. Like You need to create an interface, but then what if one fragment gets created before the other one, then the activity needs to talk to each other? Or like when the activity is restored, you don't really know which fragment will be restored first. It is really hard to manage this state. But we can actually solve this very elegantly using a vModel. So let's say, so these two fragments actually want to talk about a selected email, right? This is, what, this is the information they want to share. So let's put it inside a view model, and we are going to call this shared view model. So it has a mutable live data inside it, which you call selected, and it provides two very simple APIs. The first one says, set the selected email to this email, and the other one says, get the selected email as a live data. It's a very simple view model. But now, once we have this, let's go back to our fragments and see how we can use this. So inside the content fragment, which is the one that wants to display the contents of the email. So it wants to know when the selected email changes, right? So we are going to go, so we have already seen this. You can go to view model providers class and get the view model providers of this fragment. But we actually want the view model not from this fragment, we want it from our activity. So all you have to do is tell it to give it from your activity. Now it's going to return you a view model in the activity scope. And then we say get for the shared view model. Now the very first time one of the fragments called this, we are going to create a new one. When the other fragment comes to life, it's going to receive the same view model instance. And then you do the same thing. So this one says get the selected email, start observing on it. Very similarly, in the selector fragment, which was the one on the left where user picks an email, we get the same view model. And then whenever the user selects an email from the list, we just call the view model's related method to change the selected email. Now, these two fragments talking to each other without actually talking to each other. How does it really happen? So if we go back to our UI, so we had the selector on the left, the content on the right. But if you look at the details, actually both of these are talking to a shared view model. They never talk to each other. The beauty of this solution is that if you are on the phone, let's say one fragment replaces the other one, there is no room for error. Like the fragment still talks to a view model, view model is always there, nothing will crash. They don't even care the other one is there. OK. So this was a lot of information, and there's like further details about how these life cycles work. We really spent a lot of time to make these like 
handle the most common use cases on Android. So we recommend you to first try it out. You can try it now in uh, maven.google.com. Please check out all of the architecture components. These are things that actually work very well together. We have an architecture guide which shows you how to use these things together to write a good application. And also check out our code labs. We have code lab sections at I.O. that will give you a first glimpse of how life cycles work. Thank you.